Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here, talking about a key element of our spiritual walk, one in which if we don't learn to get right, will actually prevent us from going into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I need the element of suspense in this video because most people would overlook what I'm about to say, assuming that they know all they need to know and they'd have no room for improvement. So if I had titled the video a different way, they would have dismissed it without even watching it saying they have no need for that particular instruction and they won't watch the video and many of them will find themselves locked out of the kingdom of heaven because they don't fully understand this concept that we are about to talk about in this video and what we're talking about is spirit to spirit communication now when i started to do this video this morning I actually wanted to talk about healing and how it is necessary for the envoys of this era. You people who are listening to the third testament of the Bible, it is absolutely necessary that you learn how to heal people. We have this ability and we were instructed by the Messiah to do so, to heal the sick. But many of us don't know how to do it. And I plan to do a class giving instructions on how healing works. And I'm sure you won't be surprised that it doesn't work like you see them doing it on TV. Healing actually works through prayer. But while I was thinking on doing that class, giving instructions on how we're supposed to go forth and heal and how exactly that healing is supposed to work. And I was thinking, well, the majority of the people don't know how to pray because of what we learned in the church. We're actually missing a few key elements and that's the reason why most prayers go unanswered. So let's humble ourselves for a moment, assuming that we're not experts on praying and let's try to understand how our prayers can become more powerful. Now, this class will be coming out of the third Testament of the Bible, which you can find a link to in the description of this video. The third Testament is the book for the new covenant meaning it is the instructions that we are given for us to learn how to live within the new covenant. And one key element to the new covenant is that our communications with the father will be spirit to spirit instead of materialistic, like we were taught in the churches. So let's jump down to chapter 17, which is called the new way of worshiping God. And we're going to look at a few verses that talk about this extremely important, but yet often overlooked element of our prayers. And I would advise you to go back and read or listen to this entire chapter because it has a wealth of instruction related to prayer. And in this video, we're only going to concentrate on one key element. So check the description for links. There's both an audio version and a PDF version that you can download from this website that we're looking at here called jesus-comes.com. So let's get started. The first verse we want to look at is verse six, which says prayer is the spiritual medium that I have inspired in man so that he may communicate with my divinity. That is why it manifests in you as a yearning, a necessity of the spirit as a refuge of the time of trial. And that's the key element that we're going to be talking about here. The so-called spiritual element of our prayer. Verse seven says, who does not know true prayer does not understand the joys contained in it and does not know the source of health and goodness to be found in it. Meaning if we don't know how to pray, then we're not going to be able to take advantage of what prayer offers. And this is why many of our prayers go unanswered. It says they feel the impulse to speak to me and present their petitions, but lacking spirituality, they feel that the offering of sending up only their thoughts is so meager that they instantly look for something material to offer me, thinking that that will flatter me more, meaning that we are very materialistic when it comes to our prayer. Some rely on figurines or artifacts in order to pray while others rely on verbal communication. But we're going to find out here that verbal prayers or verbal communication with our father is actually useless, believe it or not. But let's go on. 
Verse 8 says, It is in this fashion that humanity has fallen into idolatry, fanaticism, rites, and external worship, drowning their spirits and depriving themselves of the blessed liberty of praying directly to their Father. Meaning that if we're praying verbally, we're not actually praying directly to our Father. Like we learned over in the gospel, according to John in chapter four, our father is a spiritual being and he expects us to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, it is this third testament of the Bible that is teaching us how to worship him in spirit and in truth. But back to the third testament, verse eight says only when the pain is very intense, when the pain is at its limits of their human strength, does the spirit. Forgetting ceremony and knocking over idols frees itself and arises to cry from deep within, my father, my God. Now, this is why a lot of people discount baptism, because after they are baptized and not taught to communicate with the father correctly, they see no change in their life. But it's only when they find themselves in a severe case of trouble that they start communicating to him correctly and then their prayers get answered. And that's why a lot of people point to some event in their life, like a car accident or a fire or some other trouble that they believe that caused them to get the Holy Spirit. But what actually happened is in that moment of pain or emergency, their spirit cried out correctly and their prayers were answered. But anyway, verse nine says, do you see people occupied making war on one another in this materialistic time? Yet I tell you, even in the middle of these wars, many men have found the secret of prayer, that which is born of the heart and comes to me as an urgent call, a protest, as a plea. So when you find yourself on the battlefield getting shot at and you start to seek out our father for help, most people are not going to drop to their knees at that moment, collapsing their hands together and closing their eyes and saying a verbal prayer. No, in the heat of that battle, at that moment, true prayer is going to emerge. And that's when they're going to realize where our father dwells. Verse 10 says, when they see the requested miracle happen, they know that no other way exists for speaking to God than with the language of the spirit. So at that moment, they learn spirit to spirit communication and they see no need for the materialistic worship that they have always known. Now let's drop down to verse 14, which says prayer is a blessing which God has granted to man so that it will serve him as a ladder to elevate himself, as a weapon to defend himself, as a book to educate himself, and as a healing balm with which to anoint himself and to heal all illnesses. So after we learn to pray silently, all of these gifts, all of these blessings of prayer will become unlocked to us. The ability to elevate our spirit, weapons to defend ourselves, we can educate ourselves through prayer and we can also heal ourselves through prayer and we can even heal others. But what we're going to learn here is that if we attempt all of these things through a verbal prayer, those prayers will go unanswered. And that is why many people don't rely on prayer first when they find themselves in trouble. Verse 15 says true prayer has disappeared from the earth. Men no longer pray, and when they try to do so, instead of speaking to me with the spirit, they do it with their lips, employing useless words, rituals, and material idols. So, like I said, a materialistic prayer or a prayer that we would do with our lips is actually useless, as we see here in Scripture, just like those rituals and material idols that some people use in worship. It says, how are men going to observe miracles if they use forms and observe practices which the Messiah did not teach? Because he didn't use idols. And I'm sitting here trying to remember in all of the Gospels, did he ever give a verbal prayer? 
Sure, he talked about how we were supposed to pray, given his disciples' instructions, but in the times when he actually prayed, he was actually silent. And that's the example for us to go by. Our prayers should be silent as well. But let's go on. Verse 17 says, teach your brothers how to pray. Make them comprehend that it is their spirits which must communicate with their creator. We see in verse 17 that it is necessary that we teach our brothers how to pray. And that's why I'm addressing this video to you guys, the disciples, the envoys of the new era. It is one of your responsibilities to teach others how to pray. But let's go on. Verse 21 says, leave the earth for a few moments today and come to me in spirit. See, that's what we're talking about here. Spirit to spirit communication. We learn in the other parts of this third testament that our spirit man, the real us, has the ability to travel outside of our flesh. And that's what it's talking about in verse 21 is when we have this spirit to spirit communication with our father, our spirits are actually going to where he's at and communing with him. Now, verse 22 says, for many centuries, humanity has been mistaken in its manner of praying and has therefore not strengthened or illuminated the path of their lives with my love. For they have prayed with the senses and not with the spirit. And with the senses here, of course, he's talking about the mouths with sound. That is not spirit to spirit communication and is actually an ineffective way of communicating with our father. Verse 23 says, idolatry to which men is so inclined has been like a poison that has not allowed them to taste the spiritual delights of inner prayer. So here, from what we're learning, we see that a verbal prayer is idolatry. And that's not too hard to understand when we understand that our voices or that sound that comes out of our mouth is actually materialistic. And any materialism in our worship is actually idolatry. And as I said before, I advise you to go ahead and read this entire chapter because we're actually leaving out a lot of parts here. As we jump down to verse 41, which says, Disciples, in the second era, my apostles asked me how they should pray. And I taught them the perfect prayer, which you call the Lord's Prayer. Now, we see the Lord's Prayer over in the Gospels. One of the places is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 12. This is the example that the Messiah gave us on what we should be saying in our prayer. And of course, we're saying this silently, but this is actually the outline of the prayer that we should be using. It starts off with our Father, which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name which is absolutely necessary to any prayer. We have to use the word father, we're going to find out here, to identify who it is that we're actually talking to. If we use words like God or Lord, nobody has any idea who you're actually praying to because anything could be your God and anybody could be your Lord. So we say our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be our name every time we start a prayer. Now, let me jump over to the Lord's Prayer as we find it in the book of Luke, because it actually gives a lot more detail. Like, for instance, how we're asking for our Father's will to be done here on earth. And we're asking him for the provisions to feed us every day. And we're asking for him to forgive us of our sins and to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Those are extremely important and necessary elements of our prayers that we should be saying every day. If we don't ask our father to deliver us from evil or to lead us out of temptation, then we are subject to that evil and that temptation. So we make sure that these are parts of our prayer. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 42 says, now I tell you, be inspired by that prayer, by its meaning its humility, and its faith, so that your spirit communicates with mine. For it will not be your material lips that pronounce those holy words, but your spirit that speaks to me 
in its own language, meaning spirit to spirit communication. So we're using the Lord's Prayer as a blueprint or an outline, but we're saying that prayer spiritually. We're thinking it. We're communicating from our hearts when we say that prayer to our Father. Verse 43 says, do not let it be only your lips that call me Father, for many of you tend to do this by rote. Now, notice here how this scripture keeps frowning upon using our lips to communicate with him. This is why I keep saying that a verbal prayer is useless. But this part is actually talking about the word father that we mentioned a few minutes ago. This is his preferred name. You hear people calling him all kinds of names, some in Hebrew, some in Greek, some in English, all kinds of names that we use to address our creator. But what he prefers us to call him is father. And that makes sense. When you understand that he is the father of our spirit man, the real us, just like we have a daddy who is responsible for helping to create our bodies, our heavenly father actually created our spirit. Our spirit was born from him, and that's why he is our father, and that's why we address him in that manner. This is a key element to our prayer using the word father and is often overlooked. So this is why you come to this channel for this type of information. Otherwise, your prayers could go unanswered. And we all better learn how to pray now or we're going to find ourselves neck deep in trouble. So let's learn how to pray effectively now, putting away all of the false doctrines about prayer that we have been taught all of these many years. It goes on to say, I wish that when you say our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Those words come from the purest part of your being, meditating on each one of the phrases so that you are afterwards inspired and in perfect communication with me. See how important this is starting our prayers with our father who art in heaven. And we don't do so by rote. We actually have to think about and meditate what we're actually saying. And by doing so, our spirit is actually able to elevate itself and communicate with our father directly. Like it says there, inspired in a perfect communion with our father. Verse 44 says, I taught you the powerful masterly word, that which truly brings the child closer to his father. Talking about the word father. He's calling it a powerful, masterly word that we use in our prayers. All of those other fancy words that people are using to address him are just as materialistic and ineffective as verbal prayer is. He prefers to be called father. And I didn't say daddy for those who like to use that word. Your daddy is that dude that married your mama, although it may sound cute. I don't think our father appreciates us calling him daddy. Never says that in this scripture. He prefers the word father. And that's why in the Bible, we were told to call no man father. He is our father. But anyway, it says upon pronouncing with respect and sincerity, with elevation and love, with faith and hope, the word father distances disappear and the spaces are shortened for in that instant of spirit to spirit communication, nor is God far from you, nor are you far from him. So by opening our prayers in this manner, we're actually allowing our spirits to communicate with him. So this too is one of the most important parts to our prayer. And you see how often it is overlooked. As people start their prayers saying stuff like God or Lord or whatever they want to say and even saying verbal prayers and then they wonder why their prayers don't get answered. They say prayers like God, please give me a car. And then next thing you know, they're down there at the car dealership filling out paperwork because they know that their prayer is not going to be answered because they're used to the idea that their prayers are not answered. So they don't bother to even wait on the father to give them that what they request.
dropping down to verse 53, it says, my people, you now hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, the spiritual manifestation of God through your understanding, not to reveal a new law, nor a new doctrine, but a form that is more advanced, spiritual and perfect to worship and communicate with God. This is what the Messiah was talking about over there in John and chapter four. You see where it says in verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him. This is what verse 53 is talking about. A form that is more advanced, spiritual and perfect to worship and communicate with our father. Now let's drop down to verse 60 which says the elevated spirit knows that the human word impoverishes and diminishes the expression of the spiritual thought. So our words, when we say prayer verbally, it actually impoverishes and diminishes the spiritual communication. So for those of you who want to say that we can pray verbally or we can pray silently, you might want to go in and delete that comment because it's not true. Verbal prayer is not only useless, it's actually harmful and hinders our communication with our father altogether. And our spirits, once elevated, don't communicate with the father verbally. It says, for that reason, it, talking about our elevated spirits, silences the lips of the flesh in order to elevate and express itself with a language which only God understands, the secret which it has concealed within the innermost being. So when we're there and we're thinking our prayers, we're communicating with our Father Spirit, the Spirit, our Spirit has the opportunity to send up its own prayers and communicate what we actually need. But if we're actually saying our prayers verbally, that materialistic sound coming out of our mouths is actually getting in the way of our prayers and renders those prayers useless. So this, I hope you see why it was necessary to do this class before we did a class on healing, because I can talk to you all day about how to heal a person with your prayers or with your thoughts. But if you don't know that you're supposed to be doing so silently, you're going to be wasting your time and you're going to be wasting their time and you're actually going to be harming the faith as you and they see those prayers for healing go unanswered. For most people, when you talk about using your thoughts or your prayers to heal people, they will even laugh at you because they're used to the idea of their prayers going unanswered. And it seems silly to them that you would even try to heal people through prayer. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 61 says, how much pleasure you give to my spirit when I see that you elevate your thoughts in search of your father. Talking about spirit to spirit communication. He receives pleasure when we pray silently. He says, I allow you to feel my presence and I fill you with peace. So for some of you who have never tried to communicate with the father silently, this is actually a great day for you. You're actually going to go try this and he's going to do just what he's talking about here. When you start a spirit to spirit silent communication with him, He's going to make his presence known to you in that moment. So give your testimony in this video and let us know how it turns out. We're going to go on to verse 62, which says, seek me, speak to me and do not let it bother you that your thoughts are slow to express your petitions. Meaning while we're praying, we don't have to get every word right. It is in the act of spirit to spirit communication that this spirit to spirit communication does what some people would consider speaking in tongues does or praying in tongues does. It allows the spirit to communicate even in a language that we don't really recognize during that moment. So all we have to do is open up the communications remembering to be silent and our spirit man will actually do the work for us. 
he will be the one that will actually get our petitions right. It says, I will know how to understand them. Talking about the words that come through our spirit. He says, speak to me with the confidence with which one speaks to a father. And in this case, it actually should have used the word daddy. So we talk to our fathers the same way we will talk to our daddy as we make petitions and requests with confidence, knowing that he hears us. Tell me about your concerns as you would tell them to your best friend. Ask me what you do not know or comprehend, and I will speak to you as a teacher. But pray so that at that blessed instant in which your spirit elevates itself to me, you might receive the light, the strength, the blessing, and the peace which your father grants to you. All of these things come when we learn to pray spiritually. But if we only know how to pray verbally, we're not really used to any of these things coming to us. Light, strength, blessings, teachings. All of those are alien to us because we don't know how to pray. 63 says, tell me in silence your sorrows. Confide to me your yearnings. Talk to our father in silence not materialistically with our mouths. It says, though I know all, I wish you to learn to form your own prayer until you come to practice the perfect communication of your spirit with the Father. So while some of you today may be the first time you communicate with our Father spirit to spirit, you don't have to worry about getting it right. All you have to do is think your prayers starting off with our father who art in heaven and your ability to pray will actually evolve over time until it becomes a perfect communication of the spirit with our father. Now let's drop down to the section called daily prayer. Verse 69 says, beloved disciples, practice spiritual prayer daily, putting into it all your intention of coming to perfection. Now, for me personally, I try to, and I think I'm at about 95% accuracy of praying every day before I actually get out of the bed. A lot of times my wife thinks I'm still sleeping and that doesn't bother me at all because she brings me a cup of coffee or whatever in bed. But most of the time I'm actually there praying, performing this daily prayer that he's talking about here. Verse 70 says, see that in addition to entering into intimate communication with your master and experiencing an infinite peace in those moments, it also represents the best opportunity for you to receive my divine inspirations daily. We get these inspirations daily if we learn to communicate with him. One of the things that I pray for every day is for you guys that are listening to these videos and I also pray for the topics of the video that he wants me to do that day. And I believe that it is the result of that prayer that he actually gives me inspiration or instructions so that when I start these videos, I can be sure that I'm actually within his will teaching what he wants me to teach. But that goes for everything. If I'm working on the farm that day, or if I'm working on the truck that day, or if I'm working on the house that day, by remembering to pray that morning, I can be sure that he's actually helping me and instructing me and leading me throughout the day. But if I fail to do so, I'm pretty much on my own. But anyway, it says, in them, you will find the explanation for all that you have not understood or that you have misunderstood. Remember how a few minutes ago he talked about how he will teach us through spirit to spirit communication? Well, this daily prayer is what initiates that teaching. We have asked him for instruction and throughout the day he gives us this instruction, helping us to understand what it is that we need to know. It says, you will find the way to avoid some danger to resolve a problem or to resolve some confusion. 
in that hour of blessed spiritual communication, all your senses will clear and you will feel more disposed and inclined to do good. This is the result, one of the results of daily prayer. And you'll find some of the other benefits when you read this entire section, but we're only talking about spirit, spirit communication here. So we're going to drop all the way down to verse 88, which says, pray, but let your prayer be formed by your intentions and actions of the day. That will be your best prayer. So here we are communicating spiritually with our father on what our day will involve, what it is that we want to accomplish and allowing him to have his will in our life as well. But it goes on to say, if you wish to direct a thought to me containing a petition, say then to me, Father, your will shall be done in me. So here was what we're talking about. We're Like we learned over in the Lord's Prayer, we are to ask for his will to be done in our life. Sure, we have free will. And if we don't say this prayer, if we don't include this in our prayer, then our free will will be dominant and we're subject to be outside of his will at times. And we don't want that. So we include that in our prayer daily, along with leading us out of temptation and delivering us from evil. It goes on to say, you will be asking even more thereby than you could hope and understand. And in that simple phrase, that thought, you simplify the Lord's prayer that you asked me for in another time. So asking for the Father's will is an extremely important part of our prayer. Verse 89 says, there you have the prayer that acts all and that speaks best for you, but do not say it with your lips but rather feel it with your heart for saying is not feeling. And if you feel it, you do not need to say it again, stressing here how our prayer is supposed to be silent, not using our lips. That's what this video was all about because many of us still pray out loud and are saying ineffective prayers. Verse 89 goes on to say, I know how to hear the voice of the spirit and understand this language. What greater joy can there be for you than to know that? Did you think that I needed you to tell me what to do? No, we don't have to tell him what to do. All we need to do is pray for his will. But if we don't know to pray for his will, then it's not clear to him or to anybody else, whether we desire his will to be done in our life. You have to remember our free will is dominant over his will, meaning that we can go outside of his wishes anytime we want to. That's part of what it means to be human is that we have free will and we can do almost anything that we want. But anyway, let's go on. Coming all the way down to the section called the power of prayer and looking at verse 124, which says, when one of you prays, you do not realize what you reach spiritually with your thoughts. And it is necessary that you know that when you pray for your brothers, for those people destroying themselves in war, in those moments, your spirit is persecuting a war as well, a mental war against evil and your sword which is peace, reason, justice, and a yearning for the good of your brothers clashes with the weapons of hatred, vengeance, and pride. See, this is why it's important to teach our brothers how to pray. This is why it's important to know how to pray because our prayers are actually waging war against all of the evil of this world. If there were not people out here who actually knew how to pray. You can imagine this world would actually implode on itself. So then imagine what happens when more people learn how to pray. Well, consider sharing this video and hit the like button and leave a comment, sending a message to the YouTube algorithm so that it will help get this video out to other people. 
verse 125 says, this is the era in which men realize the power of prayer. And for a prayer to have true power and light, it is necessary that it be sent up to me with love. So in this era is when the true prayer warriors will stand up because it is now that we're going to learn how to pray correctly. Spirit to spirit communication. No longer is people going to be saying, God, do this and Lord, do that. We're actually going to be praying to our heavenly father. Silently. 126 says thought and the spirit united in prayer create in mankind a force superior to any human strength. Think about that for a second. Thought and the spirit united in prayer is more forceful than any human strength. Thought and prayer. Verse 127 says, in prayer, the weak are strengthened, the coward dressed in carriage, the ignorant are illuminated, and the clumsy made able. So once we learn how to pray, we get all of these blessings, strength, courage, intelligence, even dexterity as the result of knowing how to pray correctly. The spirit, when it has achieved harmony with the mind in order to reach true prayer, becomes an invisible soldier who leaves behind for a few moments that which touches his being and passes to other places, frees itself from the influence of the material and gives itself over to the struggle to do good, to banish danger and evil and to bear within a glimmer of light a drop of balm and a breath of peace to the needy. See guys, this is why you are the envoys. This is why you are the forerunners. This is why you're learning how to pray. And this is why you're going to help save humanity because you know how to pray. And when the time comes, when we start to see Jacob's trouble or the apocalypse or these wars or any of this other stuff going on, it is you guys, these true prayer warriors that's going to stand up knowing how to pray and knowing how to fend off some of these elements, volcanoes, wars, famines, plagues, you name it. This is the number one weapon that our father has given us. And now we just need to know how to use it. Look at verse 141. It says, I thirst. I said to the mob that did not understand my words and enjoyed my agony. This is talking about when the Messiah was crucified. It says, and now what can I say to you when I see it is not a mob, but the whole world that wounds my spirit without seeing my pain. My thirst is infinite, incomprehensible, and only your love can quench it. So why do you offer me outward worship instead of love? Talking about our materialistic prayer. That's an outward worship. That's a materialistic worship. It says, do you not know that instead of water, you are offering me gall and vinegar? He's comparing our verbal prayers to gall and vinegar. Really? 144 says, day after day, your spiritual prayer whose language your material nature does not understand because it has no words pronounced by your lips, nor ideas formed by your mind comes to me. So again, while we are in this spirit to spirit communication, our spirit is doing just that. It is communicating in a language that our minds and our lips don't even understand. It says the prayer of the spirit is so profound that it is beyond the human senses and powers. See, this is why we got to pray spirit to spirit, guys, because otherwise we don't know what we're supposed to say in the midst of those prayers. It is our spirit that needs to communicate with our father. And our lips are only getting in the way. Verse 145 says, by that prayer, the spirit comes to the regions of peace and light where elevated spirits live and saturating itself with that essence returns to the transitory body to pass strength to it. Now, when you're talking about these elevated spirits, you're talking about people like Abraham or Elijah or Moses. 
These are people who don't have to continually be reincarnated down here to learn how to live within the law. Once we learn to live within the law and complete our spiritual missions, we become elevated spirits. Well, when we pray spirit to spirit, our spirit actually goes where these individuals are saturating itself with their essence, then returning back to our body to give us strength. Look at how powerful this stuff is, guys. Too bad arrogance will prevent a lot of people from even trying to understand that their prayers may not be correct. But anyway, 146 says, people, the time when you must know how to pray has come to you. And as some of these worldly events start to intensify, we're going to understand this more and more. And it says today, I do not come to tell you to prostrate yourselves on the ground. I do not come to tell you to pray with your lips or that you clamor to me with florid words and beautiful prayers. God, how many times have you seen the so-called florid words and beautiful prayers? Well, they're actually useless. They're not doing any good. It's just materialistic. It's just elevating that person that's saying the prayer, but their prayer is not getting answered. And the people who are hearing the prayer are not receiving any benefit as well. This is why we need to learn how to pray because the example being set by man is ill effective and is actually also hazardous. But anyway, it says today I come to tell you, Seek me with your thoughts, elevate your spirit, and I will always descend to make you feel my presence. Again, when we pray spirit to spirit, his presence will be felt inside of us. Verse 147 says, that is the language that I hear and understand, the language of truth and sincerity without words. That is the prayer that I have come to teach you in this era. So. A verbal prayer is a useless prayer. Now, verse 149 says, I reject all that which is vanity and human grandeur, for only that which is spiritual reaches my spirit and which is noble and elevated, pure and eternal. So he's rejecting anything that's vanity or human grandeur, like we were talking about those beautiful prayers with all of those fancy words in them are being rejected. It says, remember that I said to the woman of Samaria, God is spirit and it is necessary that he be worshiped in spirit and in truth. Seek me and in the infinite, in the pure, and there you will find me. See, you have to understand that the father has already returned. Now, I do understand that church doctrine tells you that you're still waiting for him to come. And for those who are still waiting for him to come, they're only going to realize it on the great and dreadful day of the Lord when we have this global earthquake that shakes down and removes all of the materialism from the world. But for those who are willing to communicate with the Father Spirit to Spirit, they're actually finding out that he is actually already here and they're learning where he's at. And that is in our conscious. The Father dwells in our conscious. But anyway, Notice right here that it's referring back to John chapter four, when it says God is spirit. This you see in verse 24 of John chapter four, which says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, like he said, this is not a new doctrine at all, guys. It's just been misunderstood and mistaught in our churches. God is a spiritual being. And it is necessary that we worship him in spirit and in truth. But you can imagine that you're not going to really learn that in the churches. I mean, who's going to keep coming to church if all you're going to be doing down there is being silent and in spirit or spirit communication? A lot of people are going to figure out, hey, I don't need to be seeing those robes and pews and altars and choirs. If all we're going to be doing is spirit to spirit communication, I could do that at home. And that is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Spirit to spirit communication at home, if not out in nature somewhere. But anyway, let's go on down in the section called the communion of the conscious between God and man. 
verse 153 says, Today I come to you with a teaching that might seem impossible for the world to practice. But once it is understood, it is the easiest to fulfill. I come to teach you the worship of the love of God through your life, your deeds and your spiritual prayer, which is not pronounced by your lips at the predetermined place, nor is it in need of forms or images or to be inspired. Now, you think all of those people who find themselves in some type of trouble will run down to a church in order to pray or even to run to some minister to pray for them. Well, that's actually idolatry, guys. Having to have images or a certain place to pray or praying with your lips, that's materialistic worship and equivalent to idolatry. Verse 154 says, While men have wanted to see me as a distant and remote God, I have proposed to show them that I am closer to them than their eyelashes. Now, Think about that for a second. He says that he is closer to us than our own eyelashes. Verse 155 says they pray mechanically. And if they do not see all they ask for immediately discouraged, they say God has not heard us. But it's not that our father is not listening. It's that we're praying incorrectly. We're sending up materialistic prayers that he doesn't really appreciate. Verse 156 says, if they knew how to pray, if they united their minds and hearts with their spirits, they would hear the divine presence of the Lord in their conscience and feel his presence very close to them. See, this is where our father lives or this is where he dwells as far as we are concerned. Of course, he is universal and he is in everything that he has created from the grass to the animals, to the trees, to the people. He is in everything. But as far as we are concerned, he dwells in our conscience. That's where that voice is coming from, from our conscience. And that's where we will feel his presence. It says, but how can they expect to feel my presence if they act through materialized worship? How can they possibly sensitize their spirits if they worship even their Lord through images made with their own hands? So since he dwells inside of us, inside of our conscious, how can we expect him to be answering our prayers when we're talking outwardly? It's like I'm standing in the room with you. But instead of talking to me, you're yelling out the window. Verse 157 says, I want you to understand that you have me very close to you, that you can communicate with me, feel me as well as receive my inspirations easily. So we don't need to be yelling out the window. For saying verbal prayers, we need to be thinking and praying spirit to spirit. 158 says, Practice the silence which favors the spirit so that it will find its God. That silence is like a fountain of knowledge and all who penetrate into it will be filled with the clearness of my wisdom. So silence is golden, guys, when it comes to spirit to spirit communication. So learning to pray in silence will have us filled with the clearness of his wisdom. It says, the silence is like a clothed path with indestructible walls to which only the spirit can access. Man constantly carries within his intermost the knowledge of the secret place in which he can communicate with God. So silence is a place of communication. It's extremely important. Unlike materialistic prayers with our lips, we want our prayers to be quiet. It says, you can communicate with your father wherever you are, for the places is of no consequence. It can be at the top of the mountain or if you find yourself in the depth of a valley, in the commotion of a city, in the peace of your home or in the midst of a struggle. If you seek me in the interior of your sanctuary, in the midst of the deep silence of your elevation, 
the doors of the universal and invisible temple will be open instantly so that you can feel yourself truly in the house of the father, which exists in your spirit. Guys, how powerful is that? We praise the Lord for these instructions because it is becoming more and more important for us to learn how to communicate with them as these times get more tribulous. Now, verse 160 says, when the pain of your ordeals overwhelm you and your afflictions of life annihilate your senses, if you experience an intense desire to obtain a little peace, retire to your chamber and seek the silence, the solitude of the countryside. There elevate your spirit, guide him by the conscience and enter into meditation. The silence is the kingdom of the spirit, a kingdom that is invisible to human eyes. So here it is also talking about silence that we can find out there in nature. And that's an important place to visit when we want to hear from the father directly. So this is what I'm talking about when I say find a quiet place to pray. You might want to go to a park or something if you live in a city. Otherwise, you'll want to go to the countryside to say your prayers if you are really needing to hear from him in those moments. So there you have it, guys. I could go on and on. I've actually got a lot more verses to cover here, but I believe we want to save them from next time because I believe we covered enough for you to get the point. Verse after verse, passes after passage is telling us that a verbal prayer is materialistic, idolatrous, ineffective, and even destructive. So we really need to learn to pray spirit to spirit. And we do so by first thinking our prayers and starting those thoughts with our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, meditating on each phrase allowing our spirit to elevate to where the father is at, where it can gather nourishment and power and strength and knowledge that it could then bring back to us that we could use on a daily basis. So go out and get this book, guys, whether you get the PDF or listen to the audio or even buy a copy. All of those links are in the description and check out chapter 17. It is one of the longest chapters in the book. But it is one of the most important chapters in a book because it's telling us how to worship the father in spirit and in truth. So if you got anything out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't hit the dislike button, but leave us a comment either way. Remember to subscribe to this channel and pray for us.